Andy, how are you? I'm doing well, Jan. I was trying to find a joke, but I, I have, I've run out of them, so I can't give you any jokes on command while we do this. Nice. I actually did prepare an icebreaker as well, so maybe that, that is the icebreaker. <laughs> awesome. Um, so where, where are you located right now? Jan, right now I'm in Barcelona. I was escaping the city. escaping the winter in London and and headed over to Barcelona. So broadcasting live Great. from here. How's your weather? Much better than London. It's tremendous. <laughs> Probably even better uh, than in, in Hamburg as well. We just had rain uh, thirty minutes before we had uh, also some some sun. But I mean that will change as well. Cool. So I guess we're live on all platforms. Uh, hello everyone uh, out there on YouTube and LinkedIn. This is the first time we use that, that platform actually, which is Restream. Uh, and we stream on YouTube and on LinkedIn live. Um, today, Andy and I were talk about Nice 2 and Dora and what it means for financial industries. And before we start, before I hand over to Andy, uh, just a real brief introduction. Um, my name is Jan Schapansky. I'm one of the co-founders uh, and the CMO and a consultant here at Yodokos. Um, I have, let's say, 13 years of experience with the Atlassian products, worked in different roles. Over five years now, I'm in the professional service business. And I'm also one of the Atlassian community leads here in Hamburg, so I'm pretty close to the community as well. And my personal hobby focus topics, if you, if you say that, you, you could do that as a hobby is IT service management and safe action. So I really, really love those topics. Um, real quick about Yodokos and who we are. Um, Yodokos was founded in 2019. We're now an Atlassian Platinum solution partner. Uh, we also a cloud first solution partner, uh, which is not an official title. Uh, we name ourselves that way because uh, back then um, we, we thought it's uh, it's important to focus our business uh, on cloud. Uh, now you can see actually all the all the icons as well. Um, so yeah, to really focus on cloud and on cloud solutions. Uh, back then, Atlassian um, still had server running. Now we just have data center and cloud, um, and Atlassian uh, is moving to cloud. And this is the this is the goal. So we're right now fifty employees uh, across Germany. Actually, we do have um, four offices, although we are a 100% remote uh, company, we do offer our colleagues uh, the opportunity to, to go to offices. And we have over 30 partners. Um, Heiko is one of them, uh, which is really important to us because they add uh, a lot of value to what we do um, at our customer side. And um, yeah, at, at the piece of knowledge we, we need, actually. Um, what we do here at Atlassian, uh, at Yodokos, um, is Atlassian cloud migration, process digitization, optimization, license management, all around uh, the Atlassian tools, uh, device 42 and Sneak actually, and product trainings. More specific, we do have um, solutions uh, around the Atlassian tools, uh, device 42 and Sneak, um, that you would typically see in the IT service management, enterprise service management area, uh, digital workplace and collaboration platforms such as Confluence, uh, knowledge management, which is also part of um, the IT service management uh, and Confluence, obviously, test management, DevOps and agile transformations, uh, which is mainly uh, around Jira Align. So, and without any further ado, I just uh, add your screen uh, to our today's call. Andy, it's your floor. Perfect. Thank you, Jan. Just confirming that you can see my slides. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Phone. Hi, everybody. I'm Andy Fernandez. I'm the director of product management here at Haiku. I was going to come up with some form of hobby, whether it was going to the beach or surfing, but Jan mentioned IT service management. So I feel I have to come up with a more professional one. So I will say DevOps, Jan. That might be true, might not. Um, but that will be my hobby for today. But for, as a focus um, from my career, uh, the entirety of my professional career has been focused on data protection. 
whether it's business continuity, disaster recovery, high availability, but also backup and recovery. And here I am representing Haiku. We're a partner of Yodicus. We're a marketplace partner and also an Atlassian Ventures company. Uh, in fact, in this space with the coverage that we have, we're the ones who are recognized by Gartner in enterprise data protection as well. So there's a couple areas that we really want to focus today's presentation. And it targets specifically understanding, even at the basic level, what is NIST2, nice what is DORA, and what are the things that you can do from a data protection, from a business continuity perspective, to make sure that you're prepared, that you're compliant ahead of time before these deadlines are looming. Now, although the focus is NIST2 nice and DORA, uh, initially I'm gonna mention something about NIST2, nice but we're gonna focus on DORA. The reason being is DORA is a much more extended, even deeper focused regulation. So if you are DORA compliant, you will be NIS2 compliant as well. Uh, and as you know, within NIS2, um, it is a continuation and an update of a directive for the EU that every single member state will have to create uh, legislation for as well. And, and in reality, the reason why you see NIS2, the reason that why you see DORA is simply the proliferation of cyber attacks. We see not only individual attackers, state-backed attackers and entire uh, dark web organizations that are explicitly focused on going after critical public sector infrastructure, going after uh, organizations and victims all over the EU and in the entire world. And in response, obviously, uh, the EU and many member states have really focused on making sure that cybersecurity is ramped up not necessarily just government institutions, public sector institutions, but also everything that makes up private organizations that keep us keep the world flowing, whether it's transport, whether it's energy, whether it's digital infrastructure as well. But specifically within these two, banking and fin financial market infrastructures are named. But what we're really going to drive in here, and, and just as a reminder for those who are just joining, if you are a financial institution, and you are DORA compliant already, you will be NIS2 compliant simply because DORA goes even further than NIS2 as well. And we'll provide a, a, a summary for you of this. But what is DORA? It's the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Now, this act, once again, by the EU as well, creates a binding and comprehensive uh, ICT risk management framework. The reason why we're mentioning ICT here is because this concept of ICT is no longer just server deployments of business applications, data centers, but it also extends to cloud, specifically things like Atlassian Cloud and any other cloud service or platform that you use. Now, just to name a few of the types of companies and scopes, this applies to most financial institutions, whether that be banks, investment firms, credit institutions, but something to note as well, if you're a supplier of these firms, you might wanna take very, very close attention to what kind of suppliers, what kind of third parties are also going to be required uh, to be DORA compliant. For example, if your customers are financial institutions, if you serve as a managed service provider or as an ICT yourself and you serve financial institutions, you may be DORA compliant as well. So one thing to mention here, whether it's these two, whether it's DORA, it's really important to start now. It's not, it's simple, it's very similar, and Jan can tell you this, uh, similar to making sure you're moving from end of life server. It's much better to start early and have a plan versus waiting for an impending deadline. However, the difference between this and a traditional cloud migration is that this is a serious deadline. This is a government-backed deadline. And this actually has serious personal liability for those involved and also large amounts of fines for organizations that find themselves non-compliant. But there's a ton of content. There is a lot of requirements. There's a very, very large scope for DORA. And there's a few things that I'm gonna mention but we're only going to focus today on the section that Haiku is going to be able to help you with Yodicus, simply because we wanna make sure that we give you expert advice on what we understand. But if you have questions about Dora, if you have specific questions around the IT audit process, we have many organizations that we can help you and recommend. But when you look at Dora, there's some fundamental components and requirements across the board from planning, meaning understanding all of the ICTs, all of the applications, all of the services, the dependencies involved before you even begin to start your process, to also building a plan for incident response. Particularly, this is critical, not only incident response 
as you as a member of an organization that has been under an attack, but also from an information sharing perspective. There is a very explicit focus on prevention technologies. We're not going to go through those today, but we can always recommend partners that can help. Even partners like Sneak uh, on the Yodicus framework are also going to be able to help with certain sections on the prevention side. This also applies to information sharing, but the bulk of what we will cover today is going to be focused on business continuity and disaster recovery, not only from a backup, from a recovery, but also around the data storage, the data residency. What you'll see today will have a very explicit focus on Atlassian Cloud, but everything that you learn about Atlassian Cloud and how we're able to help you become compliant also applies to all other SaaS applications as well. And of course, we'll talk a little bit about the testing and being able to show demonstrable recovery as well. But in summary, if there was any slide here that really showcased what is included in Dora, it's this. What's in purple is what we're going to discuss today. But before we even get into the actual technology, before we get into the hard requirements, the most important starting point is the actual planning. Understanding your digital infrastructure, your assets, and your dependencies. And what I mean by this is, if we take, we get on a time machine and we go back 15 years ago. 15 years ago, life was a bit, a bit more straightforward from an ICT perspective, especially when it came to mapping out dependencies. Why? Because all of us primarily had a data center. There's a primary data center and maybe colo facilities, but all business applications lived in that data center. There was an Atlassian server deployment. There was a SharePoint server. There was infrastructure and compute databases, Oracle, all SAP even managed on the data center. But we fast forward to today, from a commercial perspective, every single business application that you used to use is no longer a data center or hosted on data center. It is mostly consumed as a SaaS. This applies to cloud infrastructure. This applies to communication technology like Slack. It applies to even documentation, things like DocuSign, and it especially applies to Atlassian applications that are running in the cloud. But the point here is we've done a lot of analysis. We worked with a lot of organizations and based on some surveys and, and, and reports that we've surveyed, we found that over 200 SaaS applications can be found inside of a mid-sized organization. So the point here, doesn't matter how large your organization is, but it's very important to understand that ICT mapping, being able to map out all of the dependencies and the applications that you're using is not as straightforward as it used to be. So you really have to designate a person, an expert, resources from your team to effectively map out all of your ICTs. And what does that actually mean? Well, it could be your business applications. It could even be data centers. It could be your ICT consultancy and manage ICT services, cyber security services, and even data providers and data analysis providers. We're going to have a very heavy focus on the software and application business today. We're going to talk about the Atlassian umbrella, things like GitHub, Salesforce, AWS, but really, really focused on Atlassian. But the point here is you have to make sure you have a good understanding of all of these applications that are being used. I think the lights just turned off, but I will make sure to add my brightness. But something to mention here, though, is not simply, oh, I have Atlassian. That is my ICT. That's something that we simply have to map for. But it's not. A lot of these cloud platforms, a lot of these infrastructures that you're using, they're icebergs. They have many more assets. They have many more dependencies and applications that belong to that platform. One example is Atlassian. Yes, you use Atlassian in the platform, but there are many applications that you're using. From a tracking perspective, project management collaboration, you're using Jira. From a knowledge base, you're using Confluence. From an IT service management, you're using JSM. But there's other applications like Trello, Product Discovery, Align, Ops Genie, you name it. And that is not even referencing all of the additional plugins that exist within the Atlassian marketplace, all of the plugins that exist. So when we go through this exercise of understanding our liability, understanding what we're responsible for, it'll be very, very critical to fully map out all of the services that are being used in your organization. But just to give you another example, 
take a look at organizations like AWS. That's a cloud platform. You might be sending data to AWS, or you might be running applications inside of AWS as a cloud native deployment. Well, when you look at AWS, it's not just one ICT. It's not just one thing that you're using. There are hundreds of decoupled services, all individually configurable, that you have to make sure you have a full accounting for it. For example, you might have an EC2 instance, you might have a database, you might have S3 storage, but you also have VPCs, you have IAM, you have key management, you have cloud formations. There's so many different services that you simply have to map out. You do not want any surprises once you're already going through the implementation of your framework if you haven't mapped these out effectively. Now, here's a recommendation that we follow. This is something that we do internally. This is something that we address. But this is an uh, explicit requirement from Dora. And Dora says financial entities have to have a sound and comprehensive, well-documented risk management framework. They have to be able to address ICT risk efficiently, quickly, and comprehensively. In order to address ICT risk, you have to understand all of the ICTs that your organization is using. So we recommend the following activity. The first thing you have to do is understand the total volume of all of the services that your organization is using. Now, this is a challenge, but every single organization has some form of shadow IT. You have to make sure that as part of your initiative, you are addressing shadow IT as well. But first and foremost, you cannot plan for what you do not have in your organization. So you have to map out all of your ICTs. The other ones though is you have to make sure that finally, once you have all these ICTs, including the ones that are shadow, ensure that they all follow under the IDP or they're under the single sign-on provider. So if you're using Okta, Entry ID, Ping ID, Duo, it doesn't matter what you're using, make sure that all of your services, all of your applications are configured under your single sign-on. This will help you also meet IAM and MFA requirements, but it'll also keep you sane when it comes to monitoring all of the applications that you're using that now belong to your directory. Having a directory is your best friend, but that is not the end of it. You also have to map out all of the dependencies between the assets, between the systems, between the processes. And what I mean by that is not only, okay, this is a service that I'm using, whether it's Atlassian or something like DocuSign, but where is the data hosted? Is it under my residency? Is it running in an area that is okay with me? Do I have control of it? And who's processing and where is the data being processed? This now becomes a little bit of the roots of a tree for every single SaaS application. It's a lot of work, but it's critical to be part of your framework because this will be a requirement. And something to mention, if you start this exercise tomorrow, by 2025, when all of these uh, deadlines continue, your environment will change. So you have to make sure that you have a method to continuously monitor all of these ICTs and, in, and also update your framework. That's why it's so, so important to use single sign-on activities like Okta or Entry ID because it allows you to keep track of everything that's being used. Now, that is simply the planning. There is so much more to developing the right framework, to making sure that you have the right stakeholders and a process for this framework. And we can have a conversation after that as well. But today, unfortunately, we only have an hour. So we'll give you kind of the highlights of every single area related to this. But now let's assume that we've magically, in one click, mapped out all of the ICTs and understand our dependencies, our services, and everything that we're using. Now, we have to look at the requirements from a backup and recovery perspective. Business continuity, disaster recovery, specifically in the context of these ICTs. And we're gonna start and use Atlassian Cloud as an example. Uh, this is a critical application that we use every single day that we care about, we're in the ecosystem, and it's very important for people to understand. The number one mistake that many organizations make is not understanding the scope of their responsibility when it comes to a SaaS or a cloud. Because this sh same shared responsibility model that you're using and seeing on Atlassian Cloud applies to AWS, it applies to Azure, it applies to Google Cloud, it applies to GitHub. The point here is that SaaS is a shared responsibility. And what that means is that Atlassian, for example, is responsible for the system. Then, as an ICT provider, have to be compliant according to their requirements. 
and they will keep the system uh, compliant. They will keep the system secure. But you are a tenant in this cloud and you have a shared responsibility as an organization that consumes this cloud software uh, to keep your data in control, to keep yourself compliant and to make sure that you keep your account secure. The best example or it's a very dumb analogy, so I apologize, but it always helps really get the point across is understanding the relationship between the system and the tenant. Now, from a system perspective, think of Atlassian Cloud and any other cloud-based ICT as a parking garage. Now, let's say Jan is going out Friday and Jan wants to go downtown in Hamburg. I'm sure there's some very nice restaurants. Jan decides to go to a parking garage. What does Jan expect the parking garage to do? He expects it to be open. He expects the payment processing to work. And he expects to be able to use a service, park his car, make sure that the lights are on, and that he can go have fun and know that his car will be there. The garage is responsible for meeting those requirements. But Jan is the owner of the car. Jan has to make sure that he locks his doors. He has to make sure that he has insurance on his car. Because if anything happens to his car, if he leaves his window and somebody steals his laptop or they scratch it or they even try and steal it, the garage does not take responsibility. Now, this is a very American analogy, so I deeply apologize. If in Germany or Switzerland or anywhere else, you do not have these same uh, requirements, Jan, you can correct me here. Um, but the point here is the garage is a system. The car is a user. So if somebody goes and tries to encrypt your data, if you delete your data, if you are getting audited from a compliance perspective, you have to make sure that you are in compliant because you are still responsible for your data. That's a critical, critical element to understand here. So from a, from a Boffin um, or regulative um, perspective, that means um, I, I will trust you that you are capable of uh, managing your services, your service providers, and um, that you can keep, I don't know, credit card data um, and that you can process it. So uh, that, that's a, actually a really good example. Um, so, and then, yeah, it's definitely the same in Germany as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting because it has been a gray area for years, right? We're, we're not new to SaaS anymore. It's been over a decade since things like Microsoft 365 have come out, but we still see so much gray area when it's very clear who's responsible for what. And if anyone's interested, I will add a link at the end and we can add it to the comment section, the Atlassian Cloud Shared Responsibility Model, where they explicitly provide you insights into, one, your compliance is your responsibility. It is not feasible for Atlassian to worry about every single customer's unique and boutique compliance requirements, whether they are healthcare, financial, federal, it is very different. So the customer has to take accountability here. So you as the customer of Atlassian have to understand your risk, the sensitivity. You have to make sure that you meet breach disclosure, incident response, and that you host the permitted data that you're allowed to. Atlassian cannot do this for you. You as an organization must be responsible. And it's not just compliance or account security, but it's also the responsibility for the backups. Atlassian explicitly asks you to create backups. Now, yes, they maintain system level backups. Because in case there's an outage, in case there's a global cyber event, they need to have a copy that they can go back to and restore and reinstantiate the entire environment. They cannot go into every single tenant and help you restore a deleted issue or a project or an instance. It is not feasible. It is, there's no way they can do so. That's why they are so explicit in making sure that you can create backups of your own data so that you can recover protect and achieve compliance without a support ticket. But let's understand these backup requirements a little bit clearer. Now, from a backup perspective, Dora specifically asks that you have to understand a minimum frequency of the backup that is based on the criticality of information or the confidentiality level of the data. For example, if you are using Jira Service Management and you are using this to keep customer support tickets, to manage customer experiences, this is a very, very critical application. So you will have much higher requirements from a backup frequency compared to something like product discovery, where it's an internal tool for your organization to manage feature requests. 
So you, there is proportionality. And, and when you are evaluating building a framework to under, understand SLAs, proportionality will become very, very important. So you have to understand, for example, let's just use Jira service management, very critical. We should probably keep daily backups of this versus Jira product discovery, maybe it's two, three, four days. But then this is where it gets very interesting. It's the actual backup storage itself. And a critical piece here is that it requires financial entities to actually make sure that the backups are logically segregated from the source, meaning that you have to have copies of this data outside of Atlassian or any other SaaS in case something happens. Whether it's an outage, whether it's a cyber event, you always have a copy that you can go back to. Because if all of your data is within a system, and that system is compromised, then you do not have a copy of that data to go back to. So you have to keep an offsite copy. So what we recommend here, whether it's Jira service management, whether it's any other SaaS application inside of Atlassian or out, you have to identify the services that do not have backups. You have to automate the backup process. Manually exporting your backups will not be a way to prove compliance in a court of law or in an IT audit. Whether you are using a backup service or you are scripting it yourself, you have to make sure that this is a scheduled and automated process. You do not want to have somebody miss your backups the moment that you are getting audited and you have to prove your backups. You have to make sure this is automated. And then the third component here is you always want to store the copies off site. And I don't mean a hard drive in your desk, but I mean S3 compatible storage that is accessible, that is following MFA, IEM requirements, but most importantly, that is in your control as the customer. And the last piece here is, in order to make sure that you meet the audit, you have to keep logging of these policies, of the access control, of the restore operations. This is one of the most critical requirements from a business continuity perspective. But the most important piece here is testing. Something I'm gonna mention here, and I always mention this when we're providing advice to our customers. If you have never tested your backups, I am sorry, but you do not have a backup. You have a theoretical plan in mind because we all understand Murphy's Law, whether it's a corruption, whether it's one of your scripts uh, is malfunctioning, whether anything happens on the storage side, you have to make sure that you test. And Dora is explicit regarding resilience planning and testing. So here are a couple of things that we always recommend. And this is basic backup hygiene across the board. Remember, you have to keep a catalog of all of these ICTs. It's part of your framework. It helps to have that as part of your directory. You have to make sure that you have some form of plan for your most critical applications to be able to actually test the recovery whether you want to test an entire project recovery in Atlassian or even specific data inside of it, you have to do so regularly and you have to make sure that it is fully documented. You will be asked to provide logs, to re provide reporting on the backup jobs. It is good to have a history of all of your backup activity and that you can also always identify any types of scenarios where you couldn't recover. There's the most important piece. We put a lot of effort, whether you're scripting it yourself or money in paying for backup service, you want to make sure that it's reported and that it works. But as I mentioned, you have to continuously monitor not just this specific backup for Atlassian, but how has your environment changed? Have you used new plugins? Have you used new services inside of Atlassian? Have you added additional services? Maybe something like GitHub or GitLab. All of those will be part of the Dora compliance as well. Now, with that being said, uh, I want to give you a little bit of an insight onto how we at Haiku are able to address this. Only talking about business continuity, only talking about data protection and recovery. So at Haiku, we're an Atlassian Ventures company, and we really focus on giving you enterprise class data protection. You can use Haiku at, regardless of what size your company is, but we want to make sure that we meet all enterprise requirements especially when it comes to NIS2 and Dora compliant customers. The reason that we are here, and, and I would actually call us Jan rookies in the world of Atlassian, we debuted last year at, at Team 23 um, and really introduced ourselves into this world, mainly because of reasons like this. But we notice within our customer base, and we've been protecting critical infrastructure all over the world. Think v VMware, Nutanix, AWS, Google Cloud, Azure. But what we noticed was all of our customers 
were migrating to the cloud. And that was Jira, it was JSM, it was no longer a server or data center deployment, it was now a SaaS. And what we realized was there was massive gaps in third-party coverage of these SaaS applications. So we made sure that we also went ahead and built a service that allows organizations to unify their backups, but also keep heavy and stringent compliant requirements. So just a little insight from Haiku, we have very broad coverage of Atlassian. This is one of the areas where we focus the most. We can help you back up Jira, Confluence, JSM. I won't go through every single one of them, but we also help you protect all of the services that you use around Atlassian. I won't mention every single one of them, but we have over 60 supported integrations. By the way, all of this is unified in one place, and you will see why that is so important. And we have an MPS of over 90 with industry leading customer support. Every single Haiku customer will always receive a customer success engineer who's not just there to address any concerns, but help you optimize your use as well. And of course, we were recognized by Gartner for enterprise backup and recovery as well. Now, with that being said, this is a free service that we offer before we even get into the backups. And if you are interested in this, we'll have more information for you and you can contact Jan here on, on the Yodica side. But we noticed that many of our customers struggled to actually identify all of the applications in their organization. So within our platform, we introduced something called Rgref. Rgref is a SaaS discovery service that as long as you are using Okta or Entra ID, we will actually crawl through the entire directory. The entire directory and visualize this for you. Not only visualize all of the applications that belong there. So for example, things like Jira, things like Confluence, Zoom, Zendesk, whatever it is that you're using, as long as it's in the directory, we will expose it. But even giving you the categorization by department. So if you are building a framework, if you are doing uh, a catalog of all of your uh, ICTs, it will be important to understand who purchased it, who's responsible for it. So within that directory, we actually associate all of the applications that belong to it. But my favorite and most critical requirement here is that we also tell you which of these SaaS applications do not have any native backup and recovery or automated data retention. So when you add it, sign in via Okta or Enter ID, and you discover and you find these red X's, it means that that service does not have any native recovery, no native backup automation, nothing that would meet needs to Dora or any type of security where requirements. This is something that is available and can be done within minutes, as long as you have Okta or Enter ID. And we do have a question um, yes. from one of the participants. So uh, thinking about ICT mapping, which appears could be a challenging task. Um, it looks like a good idea for a big organization uh, would be to integrate ICT mapping and control into CMDB, preferably uh, with auto discovery and make sure service assets and configuration management process is strongly aligned with security team activities. What's your thoughts on that? I think it's a great idea. I think one of the things that we're noticing is that many people are trying to solve this problem across different areas. You see organizations like Wiz do an excellent job on some of the SaaS applications. You see some organizations do it very well on the IT asset side. We haven't seen any unified approach. Approaching it from a CMDB is an incredible idea. The only area that needs to be addressed there is exposing applications that do not have any protection. But whoever asked that question, your head is in the right place. That is something that absolutely makes sense. Cool, thank you. No, of course. And please, if you have any other questions, add them anytime Jan will speak up and we will answer it. Now, just to summarize for a second, this is simply a service that allows you to discover. But now comes the important task of, okay, now let us start actually backing up this data to make sure it is compliant. As we talked about, proportionality is critical. Some of your applications will be your crown jewels, the most important applications. Others will be important to back up, but not necessarily at the same SLA. Any application that you protect with Haiku, you add via API token. From there, we automatically discover everything and allow you to assign backup policies. You can assign pre-packaged policies, but for the conversation of NIST2, 
and Dora, it's very important to talk about the policies that we have. It is the same user experience across all policies. And what we're able to do is allow you to standardize. So if you wanna actually even add different tiers of applications, and you wanna say for, for Dora, this is my tier one, tier two, you can create policies that match that approach. But what you're able to do is not only have a naming convention, but you choose the backup frequency. You can say, I would like to back up every week, every day, um, every hour, if it's that critical to your organization, you choose the backup frequency. You also choose how long you want to retain the state of form. This could be days, this could be weeks, this could be years, especially when you think about things in Jira service management and how critical some of the data is there, or even in Confluence, we see many of our customers opt for a year to even seven years of litigation holds and data retention. And then from there, you assign this backup policy. The reason this is so valuable is with a script, you have to build the script, you have to tweak the script, you have to schedule, manage it according to all of your applications. There is a high corruption rate, and there is also a high rate uh, or high requirement of your team to continuously having to manage this. With the Haiku backup policy, you assign it, it works 24 seven for you. You no longer have to do any backup operations. It is done the moment you assign a backup policy. But the most important conversation for today is where does the data go? Where are my backups being stored? And one of the core principles that we believe in here, Haiku, and it applies very conveniently to Dora in these two, is making sure that the backups and the copies are always, always, always in your control, just in case something happens. I'm giving you a, a mini reference architecture here with AWS, but we can do this with Google Cloud, Wasabi, and later on, we're even adding Azure as a storage target for this. But think of Haiku not as somebody who's storing your backups, because that's not what we do. Um, think of us as a highway, an encrypted highway that moves your data from the Atlassian cloud, your instances, all the way to an S3 compatible storage of your choice in your control that Haiku does not have access to. All data is encrypted at rest and in flight. We do not store the backups. These are stored in your account according to your residency requirements. You control where the data resides. You also control the networking, the access, the IAM, everything related to that storage bucket. By the way, fun fact, with our AWS service, we even allow you to back up the storage bucket itself in case you want even more continuity, but that'll be a different conversation for another day. All of this data is now stored on S3. And if you are very security focused and something we always recommend for your most critical applications, you can enable immutability object locked of this onto your S3 to make sure that you have a safe copy to recover. This, app, this works for Atlassian. It works for any of the other services that are protected by Haiku. But this is a critical requirement, not only within Dora, but across the board. It is best practice to have the backups stored by you, not by yet another SaaS vendor that's holding your data for you. So you, you would like to say that backup tapes is still, is still a thing? <laughs> you know, funny enough, even after watching Mr. Robot, backup mm -hmm. tapes will, will always be an interesting approach, right? And the good news is that it's no longer just going to be backup tapes, but you can have S3. There's different types of storage classes there as well. But for those that truly, truly have some uh, doomsday scenarios, you can always have backup tapes as well. Right. Um, but absolutely, it's something that I remember young, 15 years ago, people were always talking about the death tape and all of this, and it's never going to go away, is it? It's always going to be an option. <laughs> I, I do remember my first days in IT uh, where I had to change them uh, daily and bring them to, to a secure storage outside the building. So, yeah. Did you drive the truck with the tapes as well? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm glad you brought that up because it is critical to understand why having data in your control is so important. But that's just backup. Once again, if you can't actually recover from the backup, it is useless. So one thing that Haiku offers is the actual granular recovery of that. What we mean here is that with every single instance that we protect, whether it's Jira, whether it's JSM, we take a full backup, but then we catalog all of the data and its hierarchy 
and we give you the option to restore at different levels. Perhaps you want to restore an entire project, perhaps a specific configuration, perhaps an issue, perhaps an attachment, but even especially for today's conversation, conversation, something like an IT asset. What, what happens? Well, we actually take that from the source, your data, your storage, and then restore that back to production. This can be tested. This has logging, this has reported, and you are able to re recover at a high level or at a very, very deep level as well, because you do not want to have to recover an entire instance uh, every single time somebody deletes data. So backups aren't just for NIS2, Dora, for ransomware scenarios. They're also for human error. There are so many ways in which you can accidentally delete or corrupt issues and tickets. You want to be able to restore them quickly. Haiku gives you that across the applications that we protect. Now, the most important piece, in my opinion, funny enough, is actually, can you prove any of this? And Haiku comes ready to provide documentation and logging of everything. Once again, we ourselves have to follow the rules and everything is MFA enabled from the beginning. There's no tiers in which you have to pay for MFA. It all comes available to you. But you also have 24-7 logging and tracking at any single point in time, no matter what activity. Somebody logs in, somebody assigns a backup, somebody recovers. It is all logged. It is all tracked. It is all documented. For any scenario, you can enable notifications, whether that's an email or even a web host, so you get a Slack notification every time there's a backup. One of my favorite aspects of this is you have role-based access control too. You do not want a single point of failure when it comes to recovery. If you go on vacation you, or holiday, you wanna make sure that you have somebody else on your team that can recover. With Haiku, you can assign from admin to backup operator, to restore, to viewer, across the board, and you can contain that experience. And you can also make sure that you meet testing. So if you are audited, if you have to prove compliance, you can also do that as well. And something that I wanted to mention is what we just covered with Atlassian, fundamentally the same principle with every other SaaS and cloud platform. Um, I'm very confident that everyone in this conversation is probably following all the rules on prem whether it's Nutanix, whether it's VMware, file shares, you probably already have much of this because it's a much more mature area of the industry. But when it comes to cloud, your developers testing, building new applications natively, your business team, your financial team, your HR team, and their ICTs that they're using, they're probably not being protected. They're probably not cataloged. It's critical to protect all of them. And one of the proud things about Haiku and the R Cloud platform is we provide protection for all of these. Over 60 integrations and growing every single month, we add new ones as well. But we have a huge focus on making sure that the Atlassian cloud space is fully protected as well. Now, with that being said, there's probably a couple of questions. I've probably talked for a very long time. Uh, but what I wanted to mention was one of the fundamental things that we want to make sure that we offer is just a free discovery session. We can show you in our graph, at least from a SaaS perspective, you still want to have IT assets, whoever asked the CMDB question, that was a great insight, but you want to make sure that you know all of these SaaS applications that you're using. And as long as you have Okta, as long as you have Enter ID, you are eligible for this. But Jan, I will stop sharing my screen here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andy. That uh, that was really great. And uh, wow, that, that, there's a lot of stuff uh, coming to to the industry. I used to work for a payment service provider for one and a half years, and uh, I, I knew um, or I know what it takes to go through a BaFin audit or a PCI DSS audit. Um, so I can I can imagine how hard that will be. Uh, especially you mentioned that um, they are more technical than the the normal auditor that comes and visits you. Uh, so they will ask more specific questions and uh, so you be better be prepared. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's really great. Thank you for that. And for all of you, um, I just showed the meeting QR code um, here and there. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to scan the QR code, um, book a meeting with me. I will um, either forward that uh, that meeting to Andy, or we can answer all your questions. But uh, yeah, we do have the partnership with Haiku, um, so we we work together on that to help you. Um, furthermore, if you're interested, um, 
we have our newsletter. Just uh, subscribe to that. Uh, we have a lot of guest blog posts around that topic from Haiku as well. Um, so make sure you check that out as well. And I think there are no more questions uh, on LinkedIn in Egypt. So everything well explained. Everyone is curious now, not afraid, obviously. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much.